I would not, 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 big not. Just another man. Hey guys, welcome back to another video and thank you so, so, so much for joining me yet again. If it is your first time here, I'm Diwa Mujabi Lomna and on this channel, we chat about all things related to managing your money and adulting in general. So if that sounds like your type of vibe, please make sure that you check out our other content and if you like what you see, don't hesitate, smash that subscribe button and become a member of the team. Today we are doing episode two of What Would Andy Do? Now, for the benefit of those who don't know, What Would Andy Do? is a segment that we have on the channel where you guys send me your real life money scenarios and in exchange, I come on here and I tell you what I would do in your shoes. But the most important thing for me, and I love it because we got that out of episode one, is that we learn from each other's experiences, that we leverage off each other's experiences, and most importantly, that we realize that we're not alone. Sometimes it feels like you're the only one who has a specific problem or who's struggling to make a specific decision but then you find out that oh my word there are actually other people who are going through the same thing and for me this is the main point of this whole segment either than sharing my thoughts with those who would like to hear them okay without wasting any more time let's get straight into the realist the first one is what would andy do i have a property that i'm renting out and the expenses to maintain it are more than the rental income now due to the interest rates would andy sell or keep her property now, guys, this is a very touchy one, and I'm glad that I'm being asked to answer it from exactly what I would do as opposed to give advice, right? Because we tend to have very sentimental attachment to our properties, whether it's a residential property or an investment property. The first thing is, and the honest truth is that I would hesitate to sell my property with my dear life, and I would look at every possible option every sacrifice every compromise every doubt like i would look at everything else like can i downgrade my car can i sell my car can i spend less on entertainment can i cut my travel budget can i um you know live you know below my means even more by cutting certain luxuries i would do everything i can before i sell my property and the reason for that is with long-term investments like a property, when you sell under duress or under pressure, you usually, you know, take the first thing that comes up to mind and then you end up making a huge loss. So I would hesitate to sell my property and I'd look at all of the things that I've just mentioned to find out if I can increase my disposable income and be able to fit the shortfall that um, she is referring to. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would do is if I am renting where I'm at, and this is an investment property, but I'm already renting, I would strongly consider moving back into my property and maybe using the rent money towards the bond. And then I am basically paying for my own shortfall and not necessarily paying the tenant's shortfall as well as my rent. Or maybe I'm living at home, but I'm contributing towards the expenses. That money could go towards the bond. And I think the second thing is me just really trying to make sure that I'm not selling this property under pressure, especially now because it is a buyer's market. A lot of people are in this situation and they're selling their properties. And, um, you know, buyers get to be like, hmm, they can pick and choose because people are desperate to get rid of their properties and their bonds because they can no longer afford them due to the interest rates. So I would definitely make sure that I make the necessary sacrifices, including moving back into that property if it's possible um, and just pouring all of my money into that. Um, if push comes to shove, I wouldn't even mind, you know, selling my car just to keep my property because I feel like the implications of selling the property are way bigger than um, selling a car. Remember, this is just me. The circumstances might be different or the situation might be different from that person. Lastly, to close this one, guys, if I try everything that I can and I still can't afford my investment property, I am one person who will cut my losses because I know that I try everything I possibly can before I cut things off. I am very happy to let go when the time comes to let go. One thing I'm not going to do is drink water, not have any food to eat, struggle, not be happy, be super uncomfortable, get into debt, 
all because I'm trying to hold on to my investment property. So if I try one and two and none of those options can get me out of the situation, I definitely wouldn't mind getting rid of the property if it means a positive impact on my cash flow as well as my budget. I once did a how to get rich recap series where one of these ladies was literally having a cold water shower every single day because she couldn't afford a plumber to pay for a plumber and she couldn't afford the property itself. And she honestly like enjoyed all of that just to keep her property. That is not me. When it's time to let go, I will let go, but this will definitely be a last resort. The second one goes, I am living at home and considering taking advantage of the bias market situation right now and using the money I spend traveling to work because it's a lot to get a bond on an apartment for myself. What would Andy do in this situation? It's so interesting because this is also a property one. So this is someone, first we had someone who's already bought a property and they stuck. Now we have someone who'd like to get into the property space. Now this individual is saying that she wants to use her transport money in order to fill a bond. So here's the thing about property, guys. Um, sometimes it feels like the bond is the only thing that you'll be paying for, but sadly it is not. There are levies, there, depending on where you live, there are taxes um, as well, and there are rates that you need to pay and all of those things that add up to the bond. So please never assume that you can just like use your 5,000 rand um, that you spend on transport for a bond and that's it, you're done, you know, or 5,000 rand rent to 5,000 rand bond. There are other um, factors to, to put into consideration as well. So what would Andy would do, number one, is I would do my calculations right up until the last T. So let's say I'm spending 3,000 Rand. Let's say I'm spending 5,000 Rand on transport because it sounds by the scenario that it's quite a distance. So let's say that I'm spending 5,000 Rand on transport. Okay, sharp. Then the property I am looking at is 5,000 Rand as well. Okay, now I feel like these two things can sort of be on the same branch. The next thing I would do is I would do a calculation of what are the other costs that are going to be involved when buying this property. I'll give you an instance. When I looked at our costs, which is our levies, rates and taxes, they equal about 40% of the property of the minimum bond repayment itself. That means that you're not comparing traveling to work plus a bond. You are actually comparing... Um, traveling to work, bond plus extra costs. So if your bond is 10,000 Rand plus 4,000 Rand, which is 14,000. And I would just add a bit of a buffer there as well, just to make sure that I can reasonably afford the property, even if interest rates go south. So now you're looking at like a 16,000 Rand kind of bond versus the 5,000 Rand um, that you are spending on traveling, right? If you're buying a 10,000 Rand bond property. So those are the first, that's the first thing I would do. I would go to the drawing board and I would make sure that I am comparing apples with apples and I'm not just using the traveling and comparing it to the bond only. Once I've compared that, I would also look at a pros and cons table to look at what are some of the other advantages that I am going to gain from having my own place versus um, living at home. This is going to be a tough one, guys, because I mean, living at home saves you a lot of money, but having your own space and, um, you know, your own freedom and all of that stuff also does count. So then I'd compare, okay, what are the cons? What are the pros of having my own property so that I can make sure that my decision goes beyond just taking advantage of a buyer's market? My decision needs to have a lot of pros a lot of advantages to moving out rather than just comparing that. So I've already given you like a practical example of what I would do, which is going to the drawing board and doing the actual calculations. I remember the last time I did it for someone, I said, you know, 10,000 rent bond, you're looking at if you're living in an estate, rates, taxes and levies, you're looking at maybe 40 to 45%. So that takes your bond to 14.5, including electricity and everything else. And then you are looking at creating a bit of like a buffer, which is like 20%. That's another 2.9, 3,000 Rand. So you're actually looking at 17,000. And I don't say this to scare anyone, but I'm saying this is the realities of owning a property. Um, and we've just seen in scenario number one. So I'd go to the drawing board and make sure that my numbers are numbering and make sure that also my advantages are um, all good and well. But the one thing I wouldn't do definitely is buy a property because it's a buyer's market. There needs to be more than that for me. And I would also not just look at the bond in comparison to the transport costs. I would look at everything else as well. 
The third one says, I am married anti in, um, with an antinatural contract and my husband is a spender and I am not. He wants to withdraw my pension and I don't want to. The thing is, I was planning to leave a toxic environment, cash in my savings and become a housewife. But now that I have a job, I don't need the money anymore. And I feel like we can survive the way that we have been surviving all along. What would you do? I would not, 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 big not withdraw my pension um, out of, uh, after resigning. I would not do that, especially when I do not need to, like in this case where you are going to another job. There's a video that I did, and I'm not sure if you have watched it. By you, I mean the person who sent me this. But I did a whole video about the tax implications of withdrawing your pension and some of the things that you need to think about. And I'm not going to repeat all of those things. I'm going to link the video um, in the cards and in the description box, and you can take a look. But it's a big no, no, no from me, especially for these reasons. But I think something we need to think about as well is when you hear that there's money available or there's going to be money available guys i don't know what happens automatically but you start finding all these reasons why you need the money so my thinking in this relationship is that um she was planning to leave her job and cash in her pension so now the family by the family i mean herself and her husband know that money is coming or were planning for money to come and had probably started planning, okay, we're going to renovate the house, we're going to buy a new car, we're going to pay off our debts and all of those things. And now she found a new job gracefully and thankfully, but now it's like, uh, but what happens to the renovations? What happens to buying a car? And that's why he still insists on cashing out the pension, um, even though she's going to a new job. So I would definitely not do this. And I think the reasons that I mentioned in the video are enough. Um, and I think that, just forget about the fact that money was going to be available. And guys, we've got a very, very low saving rate country. Like our country savings are at a very, or rather the number of people can, that can afford to save and how much they save is not a lot. For, for most people, these this pension fund is their only savings because they're forced to do it. So imagine now if this is the only buffer and the only cushion that you have. And for you to let go of that, um, now without certainty of what's going to happen in future it can get messy it can get very messy so i would definitely definitely um, vote against even if you wanted to withdraw the pension and you were asking me what i would do and it wasn't your husband i would definitely say don't do it but even more so don't do it for someone else it's just not worth it the next one goes how would you decide on a financial institution to open an RA? An RA is a retirement annuity, given that you are on contract with no benefits. This is a very, very nice question. Um, what I would do, firstly, if I had no benefits at all, is that I would do what is called a full needs analysis. This is something that a accredited financial advisor is able to assist you with, where they sit you down, they look at your profile, and they go, okay, based on your profile, this and this is what you need from an insurance perspective. And based on your age and your goals, etc., this is how much you need to be saving towards retirement. So that's the first thing I would do is I would get an unbiased opinion or analysis on what it is that I need to have in place, given my profile and given my goals and the things that I want to achieve before looking for a provider. Then based on that, I'd be like, okay, this is how much I should be saving. These are the other gaps, etc. I look at my affordability and then I can start making decisions. The second thing I would do um, specifically when looking at an RA is I would look for two things. Number one, I would look for um, fees. What is the fee structure? So there's many different providers that provide retirement annuities. And for me, because this is like a, if I look at myself, it's like a 30 year plus um, you know, investment. You want to make sure that your fees are at the bare minimum. It's very important, guys, as important as growth, because I mean, 4% might sound small or 2% might sound small in terms of fees until you're paying that for the next 30 years, then you're going to feel it and it's going to eat away at your returns. So the first thing I would look at um, is I would look at getting a comparison from different providers based on fees. The second thing I would look at is loyalty bonuses. So there's this cool thing that providers are doing right now but obviously you need more information and you need to understand it well where they pay your um, insurance with a specific retirement product and then they add more at retirement um, for 
for retirement. They add more like a, a bonus if you don't claim type of thing. So if you can also pair those things and really leverage off the benefits, that would be great. And then I would make a decision of which provider to go for based on that. I can't tell you go to this specific provider because it depends on a number of things. And you guys know that I steer away from that because it's quite, um, you know, irresponsible in my view because you need to understand the situation a bit better to be more specific so i can tell you though that those are the some of the things that i would be thinking about and comparing as well the next one says um also very similar to the above i just secured a one-year internship i live at home and i don't have anything to my name yet what would you start with Oh, I love this question, guys. I love working or helping people who are number one, starting out and wanting to start out on a clean slate. And I also love helping people who've made mistakes because I feel like people who've made mistakes are more committed to the journey because they realize the advantages. And also people starting out, um, it's nice because you've got a blank canvas. The first thing that I would do if I had a one-year internship because... In the country that we live in, there's no guarantee of something more permanent. So I would use that year to work rigorously on my foundation. Foundation being, I would be keeping my expenses at a bare minimum. I would live at home, I would not move out, and I would not be tempted to move out or buy a car when I see my fellow colleagues doing so. I would keep my expenses at a minimum because remember... You are in a, I'm in a one year, this is me, the situation. I'm in a one year internship. I don't want to make any commitments that are, that are going to tie me down beyond this year. So live at home, don't buy a car. That's what I would do. The second thing I would do is I would, because now my expenses are way below my income because I'm living at home and I'm not committing myself to a car or any debts, I would save as much as possible towards my emergency fund. Just a simple savings account um, that I'm going to put money away to. I would do that as soon as possible. And I would make sure that I build up that a lot so that if it so happens, God forbid, that I don't secure permanent employment, I've got that savings fund that, you know, I can use to sustain myself for a couple of months and also to look for a job, guys, because looking for a job is expensive. It requires data, sometimes transport. You need to buy clothes for interviews and all of those things. So I would live for that year. Um, if you have kids and other responsibilities, it's a bit different because there's certain things you might want to look after. But if you are single like this person living at home, I definitely live below my means. Don't buy a car. I wouldn't buy, um, I wouldn't move out of home. I'd save a hell of a lot of money in the savings account and make sure that I've got a good buffer. And then when I start working permanently, then there are certain things. So when my contract gets renewed for a longer period, then I can start considering other things that I can add on to that as well. Then um, number six says, um, and I think this is the last one. If Andy had a bit of money left over every single month, where would she invest it? Hmm. This sounds like a question um, instead of a statement. So anyway, if I had a bit of money in my hands right now, and it was money that I could invest, I would definitely contribute it towards my tax-free investment. That's where my focus is right now. It is in maximizing my tax-free investment every single year and making sure that it's at a maximum. I feel like, number one, I like I would do that with my extra money because I've already chosen a few um, you know, ETFs and funds that I have in my tax-free investment that are doing really well. So I don't have to think about where to invest. I can just fund one of those um, um, investments that I have in my tax-free investment. The second thing is I feel like a tax-free is relatively safer than um, single stocks like equities and shares and stuff like that uh, because it's ETFs. So the risk is diversified and I don't have to think a lot about it. Guys, someone once said that investment should be the most boring thing that you do. And I completely agree with that. And a lot of people always want to actively invest every day and buy in and out and all of that stuff. I am not a fan of that. I want to choose a couple of stocks. I want to commit to them for the long term and then put my money there. So, um, yeah, that is what I would do in terms of like which stocks, etc. That's something that I could maybe discuss in our... 
uh, meetups for the member channel with the members where I can go a bit deeper. The reason for that is because I always want to create enough context before I name a specific investment or a specific stock because I don't want people to be irresponsible with their money. And I always feel like with these videos, there's just not enough time or I don't have um, enough context to lay the foundation and really start. And um, yeah, so that's something or a conversation that I can have. Uh, with the members because that'll be more interactive and our sessions are going to be like speaking to each other and asking each other questions versus just uh, me preaching to you in one direction but those are some of the things i would definitely put it in my tax free investment and in one of the stocks that i already have in my tax free investment that is what i would do the tax benefits of having a tax free investment are insane especially if i'm looking to invest this money for the long term so i think that's definitely the space that i would go into Guys, thank you so much um, for watching today's episode. If you did enjoy it, please make sure that you give it a huge thumbs up. And if you haven't done so, consider subscribing before you leave so I can see you in the next video. Bye.